Well, hey, it's summer. Can you believe summer's here already? Seems like it was just Christmas, doesn't it? Just like a few weeks ago, a few months ago at least. Let me encourage you during summer, you're going to hear us say this regularly, and it's important. Let me encourage you to do two things during the summer, okay? First of all, if you're in town, and I know we're all going to travel, we're all going to take vacations, we're going to as a family as well, but if you're in town, let me encourage you to be faithful in church. Don't take a vacation from church this summer, all right? So let me encourage you to be faithful. And the second thing is let me encourage you to be faithful in your giving. So whether you're here, whether you're not, the work of the ministry goes on, as Brad mentioned, and God's doing so many wonderful things here at HCC. And so we really want to encourage you to be faithful in all that God is doing. We're excited about the summer. We're incredibly excited about the fall. And we're going to be telling you shortly as we cast a vision for what is happening in the fall. God's really going to use HCC and us as a catalyst to make a difference here in the city of Hollywood, and we're excited to be telling you about some things we're working with the city, we're working with other churches, and we have some exciting announcements that we'll be making in the next couple of weeks. Take your Bibles with me today and turn to the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, John chapter 1. Today we begin a new series that we simply have entitled, Belief. Believe, and you'll understand why we've titled it that in just a few moments. I don't know about you, but I am amazed at some of the crazy things that people believe. Now, I I might step on your toes because you might believe some of the crazy things that I'm going to mention today, but, 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 but people believe some of the craziest things. For example, you know there's a large segment of our population that actually believe that Bigfoot exists. Now, you might sit back and say, Brian, he does exist. I saw him. He was there in the Everglades. Up to a third of the population of the United States believes that Bigfoot exists. A third of the population of the U.S. believe in UFOs, believe that there are literally real, unidentified flying objects. And I read a unique statistic that said 80% of Americans believe that the government knows more than it's telling us, and they are covering something up. I don't know whether that's true or not. We'll find out. Do you know that there's a large segment of people that believe that the earth is flat? That it's not, I'm I'm not making this up. Someone actually from our church gave me an article this week and said, Brian, would you investigate this article? And I investigated, and it's a Christian organization, and one of their main tenets is that the world is not circular, the world is not a sphere, as the Bible says, by by the way, but that the world is flat, and they promote that belief. This is a crazy one. There's a group of people that believe in something called urine therapy. You heard me right, urine therapy. What they believe is that there is a medical reason to drink your own urine, all right? I think that's the first time I've ever in 34 years mentioned the word urine from the pulpit, but but, uh, they actually believe that drinking your own urine has health benefits. I was preaching in Honduras years ago, and there was a pastor who had cancer, And I was with about four other pastors, and we were praying for this gentleman, and I began to talk to him afterward, and I said, so are you taking chemotherapy? No. Are you taking radiation? No. I asked him, I said, so then what are you doing? He says, literally, my doctor has me drinking my own urine. He died shortly after that, all right? So it didn't work. But there actually is a group of people that believe that. There are people today that believe that Elvis Presley is still alive. Now, now don't get excited. Supposedly, that's a sighting of Elvis Presley right there. But Elvis Presley has a fan club, and there's a group of people that believe that he is still alive. And they truly believe that. And, but the most remarkable group for me is that there's a group of people that actually believe that the Dolphins are going to make the playoffs this year. <laughs> I know I get, I, I get hit every time I say that. I'm a Dolphins fan too, so I know I'm going to have one or two people mad at me at the conclusion of the service, but uh, I'm sorry, I don't think they're going to make the playoffs. I think that is a big stretch, but uh, anyways, during the next few months, we're going to challenge you to believe. We're not going to challenge you to believe any of the things that I put up on the screen just a few moments ago. Rather, we pray this summer that your belief 
that your faith in Jesus Christ grows exponentially. As we walk through the gospel of John, you might say, Brian, I already believe. I already know. That's fantastic. Our prayer is that your, that, that your belief will grow. Maybe you're here today and in your heart of heart, you're an agnostic. There's things that you just don't understand that don't make sense to you. As we walk through the gospel of John, we want you to believe. Not just to believe in HCC, not just to believe in the Bible, but to believe in the person of Jesus Christ. That's our goal this summer. So we begin in John chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, your iPhone, your iPad, follow along with me. We're going to read the first 14 verses. I'll put them up on the screen. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. This is a great phrase. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, John the Baptist. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe. You might want to underline every time you come across the word believe in this gospel, that all might believe through him. He was not the light but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, to all who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but were born of God. I trust, by the way, that you have been born of God. I'm not talking about your physical birth. I'm talking about your spiritual birth. And by the way, Brad's going to preach about that next week in John chapter 3. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Would you pray with me today? Father, the sole purpose of our service today is to lift up Jesus Christ, to point our thoughts, to point our hearts, to point our minds towards Jesus. We know that's the goal of the Holy Spirit of God, and so I pray that the Holy Spirit would accomplish that in our minds, and in our hearts today. I pray for that person, those people, those individuals that today are struggling with belief. As we'll see in the passage, I pray that you would produce, that you would fabricate that belief in our hearts. And Lord, for those of us who already do believe, Father, I pray that you would solidify our belief. I pray that our conviction would strengthen Help us to know Jesus better. As we know him better, help us to love him more. And as we love him more, I pray that you'd help us to act out our faith. Thank you for what you're going to do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The the Gospel of John is the favorite book of the Bible for many believers. As a matter of fact, I'd venture to say that, that, that many of you here today would probably say that the Gospel of John is your favorite book of the Bible. We often encourage new believers when they start reading the Bible to start in the Gospel of John. Now, you might sit back and scratch your head and say, well, Brian, doesn't it make sense to start in the beginning? If I was going to read the Bible, wouldn't I start in Genesis chapter 1? And we always say Genesis chapter 1 is great, but we encourage you to start in John chapter 1, and you'll see even in a little bit why we say that. But, But the Gospel of John is simple, and we always encourage people to read it because it's not, it's not difficult to understand. It's simple, yet it's profound. The Gospel of John is extremely practical, but at the same time, it's incredibly theological. The Gospel of John contains some of the most well-known passages in the New Testament. If I, if I mention some of these, you would know these. John contains John 3.16. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him won't perish but have everlasting life. The Gospel of John contains John chapter 14 and verse 6 where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Gospel of John contains chapter 17, which is the great high priestly prayer, the holy of holies, as it were, of the New Testament. It contains fabulous passages. Matter of fact, I would encourage you this summer to read through the Gospel of John. John is a tremendous storyteller. He he weaves imagery, he weaves metaphors and theological language into a brilliant and, and beloved depiction of the life and the character of Jesus Christ. So as we dive into this, if you have your outline in front of you, there's a couple of things that I'd just kind of like to drive home for us today. The first is this. The Gospel of John was written with a purpose. The Gospel of John was written with a purpose. Now, John is the fourth book of the New Testament. You know that, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's the fourth gospel. So we call uh, those, those four first books the four gospels. The first three books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are often referred to as the synoptic gospels. You maybe have heard that term before. The term synoptic simply means, or it has the idea of being the same. In other words, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, those first three Gospels, relate many of the same stories and interestingly in the same order. Now, quite frankly, there's disagreement as to which book was written first. Most people hold to Mark in authorship or Mark in priority is what they call it. Mark being the first book written of the New Testament, but some believe Matthew was written first. Uh, Regardless, those three books contain very much of the same information, and interestingly, they're written in the exact same order. The first three books of the New Testament were were written shortly after Jesus' death. They were written some 30 years after Jesus died, somewhere around A.D. 60. The purpose of those first three books was very simple, to tell the story of Jesus to those who had never heard it before, to tell the story of his life, to tell the story of his miracles. John's purpose, though, is different. John's purpose is different than that of the synoptic gospels. And John tells us what his purpose is later in the book. If you want to open your Bible to John chapter 20, we'll put it up on the screen. John tells us exactly why he wrote the things that he did. And not only why he wrote the things that he did, but but why he chose the things that he chose. In John chapter 20 and verse 30, John says this, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. So John says, listen, this is not an exhaustive story of Jesus' life. There's things that Jesus did. There's miracles that he performed. There's messages that he's preached. There's parables that he told that I am not going to mention As a result, he doesn't mention much of what Matthew, Mark, and Luke says. He doesn't mention it because he doesn't believe in it, but he says there's just a lot of things that Jesus did, and I didn't write everything he did in my book. You sit back and say, well, well, what's different? Well, uh, Jesus, or excuse me, John didn't write about the temptation of Jesus, which is found in the first four Gospels. John didn't write about the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' great sermon, which is found in the first three Gospels. He didn't mention the majority of the parables. He doesn't mention the transfiguration. His gospel is different. Why is that? I believe his gospel is different because John wrote 30 years later. John wrote his gospel a whole generation after Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrote theirs. They wrote theirs somewhere around 60, 65 AD. John did not write his gospel to the earliest, 85 AD. Some believe even later, 90 or 95 AD. John's purpose then was not to tell the story of Jesus. Because 30 years later, many had already heard the story of Jesus. 
John's purpose was to defend Jesus' deity, to defend Jesus' divinity. You see, during those 30 years since the writing of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, false teaching had entered into the church. Gnosticism and other false beliefs had entered into the church, and many who called themselves followers of Christ or many who called themselves believers actually had come to the place that they began to deny the deity of Jesus Christ. And they began to question, was Jesus truly God? Or was he just a man who God greatly used? Such teaching had caused some to to depart from the faith. And so John writes this gospel with a specific purpose. Verse 31 of chapter 20 says this. He said in verse 30, he said, there's some things that I just didn't write. There's a reason for that. Verse 31, but these are written. John said, the things that I've included in my gospel, these are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. So if you're following along in the outlines, the next thing I wrote is this, John's purpose is to cause us to believe. The word believe is found some 240 times in the New Testament. It means to accept something as true. The terms believe and faith are synonyms. Faith is a noun. Believe is a verb. But faith is something that we possess. Believe is something that we do. And we're going to see that at the conclusion of the message today. But John tells us that he wants us to believe two things. John said, I've written all of my gospel, all 21 chapters, so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one, so that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that you might believe that he is the Son of God. So without apology, the purpose of our study this summer is for you and I to come to a greater conviction as to the Messiahship of Jesus Christ, as to the deity of Jesus Christ, and that that conviction would transform our lives. John says it this way, so that you might have life in Jesus' name. So today we start in chapter 1. As I read the first 14 verses just a few moments ago, you may or may not have noticed a similarity between Genesis chapter 1 and John chapter 1. Let me just ask, how many of you noticed the similarities? We read that between Genesis 1 and John chapter 1. You all get stickers at the end of the service. Brad's going to be back there and you can put a sticker on your forehead. There's an unbelievable similarity between the first chapter of the Bible and the first chapter of John's gospel. Someone has said it this way, that there are echoes and shadows of the creation in John chapter one. Now you remember, we just finished a series called The Story of God, in which we talked about four things, creation, fall, redemption, glory. And it was just four weeks ago that we spent time in Genesis chapter one. So put your thinking caps on with me and let's notice just a few similarities between Genesis 1 and John 1. So let me ask you today, what are the first three words of the Bible? In the beginning. What are the first three words of the gospel of John? In the beginning. So John begins where? All the way back in the beginning, just as Moses did in the Pentateuch. So we see a similarity there. We see, we see the similarity in Genesis chapter 1. We see that one of the first things that God created was light. And we see him dividing the light from the darkness. As a matter of fact, it says that he divided the light from the darkness. And he called the light day and he called the darkness night. And then he created the sun and then he created the moon. Well, here in the beginning of John chapter 1, we find Jesus being referred to as the light. And it talks about the fact that he came in a world that is dark to bring light to a dark world. The other other illustration that's used throughout this is the fact of life. 
In in verse 4, it says, in him, in Jesus was life. And man, you can't read Genesis chapter 1 with, without seeing life just begin to pop up. So, uh, so he creates the plants, there's life, and he creates the animals, and there's life, and then he creates man, and there's life. So here in Genesis chapter 1, we see, we see the beginning, we see light from darkness, we see life, we see a, a, a very intentional similarity between John chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 1. And so as we, as we read through that and prayed through that, we ask ourselves, why? Uh, wh- wh- why would John begin differently than Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Matthew begins with a genealogy, and, and all of them begin differently. Why would John go all the way back to the beginning? There's a reason for it. It's the second point in your notes, and I believe this. It's this. John wanted us to see that Jesus is the hero of the story of creation. Let me say that again. Jesus is the hero of the story of creation. And so John says, listen, I want you to know that Jesus just didn't begin in the New Testament. He's not just a New Testament character. He has always existed. So with that in mind, John highlights three truths about Jesus that elevate Jesus to the hero of the story of creation. So if you have your outline in front of me, the first thing that I wrote is this, Jesus was present before creation. Jesus was present before creation, John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So as you read that, now, now sometimes we're seasoned Bible readers and we've grown up in church, we immediately know who that is. But imagine that you're reading that as an unbeliever for the very first time. You're an agnostic who's reading that for the very first time. And you read the word, the Greek word is logos. And so the, the, the logos was there in the beginning. It was there with God. You, you, you would have no idea who John is talking about. And you don't know who John is talking about really until you get down to verse 14. And when you get down to verse 14, John all of a sudden clears up the muddy waters because he uses that same term. And he said, the word, logos, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And, and so John there, in a, in a very poetic way, is outlined for us what we refer to as the incarnation. And off the... Often we'll use John 1.14 as Christmas because it talks about the fact that Jesus came and he took on human form. So understand, going back to verse 1 where John says, in the beginning was the word, we must understand to whom John is referring. John is referring to none other than Jesus Christ himself. And John is demonstrating for us that Jesus existed before creation. Jesus wasn't created by God. I read things and I have discussions with people all the time and there's a group of even believers that would sit back and say, no, Jesus was created by God and they take that phrase that he was God's only begotten son and they would say, no, he did not always exist but sometime later God created him. John tells us differently. John says that he was there before the world was created. He was there in the beginning by God. Some, some believe that Jesus uh, didn't become God or, or didn't become the Son of God until birth. And so when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, God decided to make him his son. So God took this human little boy and elevated him to sonship. And Jesus became, as a result of God's decision, the Son of God. Others would sit back and say, well, Jesus didn't exist until he was born in Bethlehem. John refutes all of those theories. And John says that Jesus was present with God in the beginning. Catch this. He not only says that he was present with God, but here's what he says. He says that Jesus was very God. That Jesus was God himself. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, catch this, and the word was God. 
Please, by the way, don't allow our Jehovah's Witnesses friends to throw you off and say there's an indefinite article before that that says, and Jesus was a God. That's not what the Greek text says. Jesus was God. So we see that Jesus was present in the beginning. John tells us of Jesus' eternality and his deity. Notice the second thing, Jesus participated in creation. He not only was there before the world began, but he himself participated in creation. Verse 3 says, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So substitute him, the pronoun him, for Jesus or the verb. All right, once again, all things were made through the verb, the logos, Jesus, and without him, or or, or word, I'm sorry, I keep saying verb, I just spoke in Spanish, and the term is available, eh? And so the word is there, all things were made through him, and without him, without Jesus, was not anything made that was made. Here's what John is saying. Jesus was intricately involved in creation. Everything owes its existence to Jesus. And notice it doesn't say that everything was made by him. It's really interesting the preposition that John uses. It says everything was made through him. So the idea being that we see both the Father and the Son involved in creation, God the Father, the Creator, and the Son being the one through which that divine power flowed, and all things were created through Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul confirms that in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 6, where Paul says this, catch this, this is a great verse, yet for us there is one God the Father, for whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. Notice what, John, what Paul does. He takes the attributes of deity, which are applied to God the Father in the first phrase, and he applies them to whom? To Jesus Christ in the second phrase. And he says that all things were created by him. So Jesus was present before creation. Jesus participated in creation. Notice the third thing that John tells us in verses 4 through 14. John tells us that Jesus is the perfect fulfillment of creation. This is what I believe. This is the point that John is coming to. Let me flesh this out for just a second. Jesus not only existed before creation, he not only created, but Jesus perfectly fulfills every aspect of creation. That's why John intentionally uses the creation story in this chapter. He demonstrates that Jesus not only creates, but that Jesus fulfills his creation. Let let me show you. Do you have your Bible in front of you? So, so, So the first thing John says is this, that Jesus is the source of life. Go back to verse four. John says this, in him was life. The 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 text literally says that life exists in him. So so all the way back when life was created in Genesis chapter 1 and God was creating the plants and the animals and humans and life was created, that life, John says, existed in Jesus Christ. He is the source of our life. Here's a great verse, or two verses. Mark these down and you can read them later. Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, Paul says this, for by him, by Jesus, were all things created, in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. I love this phrase. He is before all things, and in him, all things are held together. The the word there is the idea consist. If you have an older King James translation, it says, in him all things consist. What does that mean? It means that he is holding everything together. Remember, Remember the old song, and we could sing it in sway today. We could all sing it together. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world 
Nobody wants to sing it with me. Some of you are swaying with me just a little bit, all right? You're probably dating yourself just a little bit, all right? That's exactly what, it, what John is talking about. It's exactly what Paul is talking about. Life exists in him, and without him, there is no life. That's what John says. Jesus is the source of life. Jesus is the light that shines in darkness. He says that here. Later on, Jesus says in John chapter 8 and verse 12, he says, I am the light of the world. I am the light that shines in the midst of darkness. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will walk in light. Then I alluded to it. Jesus is the perfect man. Verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The, The wording that John uses is so majestic in that verse. He not only became one of us, but the idea is that he became the best of us. He left heaven and he moved into our neighborhood, as the Message Bible says. God himself left the glories of heaven, took upon himself human flesh, moved into this sinful world and became one of us, but not only one of us, he became the best of us. He became the perfect example of what God intends for us to be. So that's what John says in the chapter. He's elevating Jesus Christ as the one who's worthy to be believed. And he says, he's the hero of creation. But then he answers the question, so how should we respond to our hero? If Jesus is the hero, how should we respond to our hero? And from verses 9 actually through 17, John kind of fleshes that out. Amazingly, and, and, and some of you know the context of these verses, amazingly, Jesus was not well received by those to whom he came. Now, now, now you would think that when God came to earth, you know, the inhabitants of earth would roll out the red carpets and their creator would be majestically welcomed. It's not what happened when Jesus came. Verses 10 and 11 say this, he was in the world. The world was made through him, but the world did not know him. He came to his own. He came to his own people, and his own people did not receive him. I read that and I asked myself the question, how crazy is that? (laughs) How crazy is that? He was rejected by his own creation. And if that wasn't enough, he was rejected by his own people, the the Jewish people. He, He was born amongst them. He grew up amongst them. He was rejected by them. Verse 12 is the key verse for us. So having laid out that he's the creator, that he came to the world, the world rejected him, his own people rejected him, John makes this statement. He transitions, and he transitions to us, which I like. He says in verse 12, but to all who did receive him, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. So here, the world at large rejects the creator who comes to earth. But but John says, but for that group of people who did believe in him, who not only believed him, but received him, God gave them the right to be called the children of God, even to those who believe on his name. Let me give you three truths, and we'll wrap it up this morning. The first is this. Catch this. This might be the most profound thing we say. It's deep. You got to catch it, okay? Belief doesn't begin with you. It begins with God. Belief does not begin with you. It begins with God. In other words, you can't make yourself believe. You can't muscle your mind to the point that you believe something that is false. Let me give you an example today. What if I stood up today and I said, I got a groundbreaking truth for you today. Two plus two does not equal four. I'm here to tell you, two plus two equals five. 
Now, I, I know some of you have respect for me, and I mean, you love me, but you're not going to walk out of here saying, oh my word, I learned something new today. <laughs> Brian taught me something that I never knew before. Two plus two doesn't equal four. Two plus two equals five. You're not going to do that. Why? Because you're not going to change your mind to believe something that you already know. Does that make sense? Listen, you're not going to walk out of here today after talking to Dr. Hill and say, and say man, unsweetened tea is better than sweetened tea. They're not going to talk to you and arrive at that conclusion, are they, Mike? Not at all. Why is that? Because sweetened tea is always better than unsweetened tea. Can I get a witness? Anybody say amen, right? All right, you know that. Nobody's going to convince you of something that you already know. So here's the idea. You can't convince yourself, nor, by the way, can you convince somebody else to believe in God. We try to do that. We have these convincing arguments. And I'm not saying don't even know the arguments. And and I'm not saying we shouldn't prevent that. But belief in God is not something that you and I produce. God is the one who makes you believe. So so in verse 12, he says, all those who receive him, he gave the right to be called the sons of God, even those who believe on his name. Notice verse 13, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but what? Of God. So in reality, there's no such thing as a disciple of Brad or a disciple of Brian or a disciple of Paul or a disciple of Peter because we don't have the ability to convince anyone to make anyone believe. It's not of blood. It's not of flesh. It's not of man. It is of whom? It is of God. Later on, John, or Jesus says this in, in John. Let me find it. He says in John 6, Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. You can't produce faith in your life. You can't produce belief in your life. It's God who produces it in you. It's God who produces it in me. So you sit back and say, shoot, Brian, then what can I do? Am I supposed to just sit here and just wait for God to fill my heart with faith, fill my mind with faith? The Bible gives us a little bit of a clue you see, we, we give God an open door whenever we expose ourselves to the word of God. You see, Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. He actually gives us a mathematical formula there saying that your faith will grow in comparison or to the, in comparison or um, uh, in accordance to the amount of time that you spend in God's word. Can can I give you a simple mathematical formula? It's not two plus two equals five, all right? Let me give you a simple mathematical formula. More Bible, more faith. Less Bible, less faith. If you look at me today and say, Brian, you know what? I'm really struggling with my faith. I'm going through something that just doesn't make any sense to me. I'm really beginning to question. You're probably not spending enough time in God's word. More Bible, more faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Now catch this. We live in the most biblically illiterate generation in the history of our country. Why do we have so little faith in our country? Why do we have so little faith in our churches? Why why are we not accomplishing great things for God? We're not giving God an opportunity to produce faith in our life. Word of God, spend time in God's word. Here's the second thing is through prayer. The disciples said it this way, very simply in John chapter 17 and verse 5. The disciples looked at Jesus and they said this, increase our faith. Increase our faith. I think it's completely valid to ask God to do a work of grace in your life and mine and to increase our faith. 
The first thing is this. Belief doesn't begin with you. It begins with God. The second thing is this. Belief results in you becoming a child of God. Belief results in you becoming a child of God. The term child here is is an extremely intimate term. John uses it intentionally. It's not the word son. It's the word child. John uses it intentionally. Listen, you get it, all right? Uh, you, you, You have a lot of friends. You have a lot of family. You have a lot of acquaintances. But you have very few children. And who are the most precious people in your life, moms and dads? Who are they? They're your kids. It's to them that you demonstrate that care, that that tenderness, that compassion, that patience. Maybe not all the time, I get it, but generally, God, God understands that. And God says that whenever we understand who Jesus is and with his help and with his empowerment, we respond by belief and we respond by faith that he at that moment gives us the right, the privilege to call ourselves a child of God. So I want you to know today that if you're here and you have by faith trusted Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you are special to God. You are his special child. You are his special treasure. You mean, you mean so very much to God that he pours out extra love on you. He pours out extra grace on you. He pours out extra mercy on you. Why? Because you are his child. I love how Paul says it. I love how Paul says it in, in Romans chapter, all of a sudden I... I got a brain freeze here in, in, in Romans chapter 5. Paul, Paul talks about, let me find it because I'm not going to say it correctly. In Romans chapter 5, Paul talks about the fact that, that um, when we were weak, Jesus died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous person would one die. For a good person, some would even dare die. But I love this. But God demonstrated his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. He demonstrated this unbelievable grace to us so that we could become his children. Let me show you the last thing, and I'm done. The last thing is this. Belief grants you access to grace upon grace. I love that phrase. Notice verse 16. John says this, For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The idea literally means grace on top of grace. You say, Brian, what are you talking about? Let me illustrate it this way. You ever going to buy an ice cream cone? And a lady says, do you want one scoop? And you go, I don't want one scoop. I want three scoops, (laughs) all right? I want one scoop of this and another scoop and another scoop. Keep piling it on. That's the idea that John lays out in the passage. God gives you, God gives me, God gives us as his children so much more than we could ever deserve. He gives you more grace. So here's what John says. John says, I want you to know who Jesus is. And I want you to know who he is because I want you to believe. I want you to believe that he's the Christ, the son of God. And by believing, I want you to have life In Jesus' name. And I want to demonstrate my grace to you. James says, he gives more grace. So here's the walkaway point. Well, first of all, if you're here today, and there's never been a moment in your life when you realized your desperate need of Jesus Christ. You realized that you were a sinner and and that as a result, you were depraved and you were condemned and and that you needed a hero to come and rescue you and you've never reached out to Jesus Christ, I would encourage you in your heart today to come to that place where you recognize your need of Jesus. Humble yourself before him. Confess your sins before him. Cry out to him and ask him to be your Lord and your Savior. And if you do that, he'll transform your life. But I would also encourage believers here today. I know I'm talking to a majority of believers. And I would remind you what we said in the very beginning, that to believe is a verb that causes us or calls us to action. Believe is not a passive verb. It's not like we trust Christ and we sit back and, 
okay, God, I'm believing. That's what I'm doing. I'm believing, you know, how are you serving the Lord? I'm believing. That's what I'm doing right now. That's the way a lot of believers respond to faith. Faith, faith is not a passive verb, or excuse me, belief is not a passive verb. It's an action verb. So, so here's the last quote that I want you to get. I want this to, to dwell in your heart and mind, and I want you to dwell on this this last week. It's this. If you don't live it, you don't believe it. If you don't live it, you don't believe it believe it. It breaks my heart to see so many people today who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ and yet they live like his enemy. They claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, but their life has not changed. Their actions have not changed. What they watch on television has not changed. The words that come out of their mouth have not changed. They're the same person they were before they believed. There's been no difference there. James talks about a person like that. Here's what James says. James says, if you say you believe, but you don't have works, your faith is dead. It doesn't exist. In other words, if you believe it, you live it. And you live it because you believe it. Is it easy to be a believer in our world today? No, it's not. It's tough. Do we always want to follow the principles of God's word? Of course not. It's difficult. Why do we do that? Because we believe it. We believe it with all of our heart. We're convicted by it. It penetrates to the very core of our being. We have become the children of God. And that belief changes our actions. We not only believe it, but we now live it. That's why Paul says if anybody is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away and all things are becoming new. Why is that? Because God is producing belief and faith and change and sanctification and growth in your life. You see, belief isn't just something you have up here. Belief is something that you have here. And when you believe it, you live it. It changes you into who God wants us to be. So, so I'm done. So, so you know what HCC needs? You know what Hollywood Community Church needs? Yeah, we need people who, who know more of the Bible, we, we, we need people to work in the food pantry. We need people to do all of the different things that we do. But more than anything else, we need followers of Jesus Christ who say, I believe it. I believe it with all of my heart, and it's changed me. I believe it, and I live it. Amen. John said, I've written these things so that you might believe, and that believing you have life in his name. May God give us life, a different life that the world wants. Would you stand with me as Stephen and the team come? Lord, thank you so much for Jesus. Where would we be today were it not for Jesus? Thank you that Jesus is the hero of the story. As we're going to see all through the book of John, he's not only the hero in creation, but he is the hero in every aspect of life, in every aspect of this world. God, help us to point our attention to Jesus. Help us to believe, not just a head knowledge, but a possession of the heart. Not something that just changes the way that we think, but a belief that changes the way that we act. Transform us from the inside out. Pray if there's somebody here that has never given their heart and life to Jesus Christ, that today would be that starting point. I pray for believers today who have had a weak, frail belief. 
I pray that today you drive them to their knees. Give them a conviction that you are worth living for. You are worth dying for. You are worth changing our lives for. Help us to have a church filled with believers of Jesus Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.